Welcome to New York, Quebec, and the water route to the center of the world. This is bonus episode 15, Ticonderoga, a place between the waters of New York and Quebec, part one. As I walked down the parking lot path next to the wheat fields that would have fed the garrison above, I was treated to a sumptuous sight, a large flat landing that ran from the edge of the glistening autumnal waters of Lake Champlain several hundred yards toward the bluff and ridge to the south. Here I passed a boatyard seeking to reproduce the bateau, and larger boats of the Lakebourne fleets needed to seize control of the water route from New York to Quebec. Prominently situated on this prime real estate is a Gilded Age mansion and a stunning Colonial Revival English-style garden. It was in this setting that I was treated to a wonderful evening soiree to open up a conference the next day. As I wandered around the gardens and grounds, I came across a state historical marker indicating that the land was the site of a major battle. Reading the inscription suddenly brought both a familial and historical connection to the ground I was standing upon. Ticonderoga is both literally and metaphorically a place between two waters. It served as one of the greatest fortresses of the Western Hemisphere due to its formidable position astride the water route that stretched from the St. Lawrence to New York Harbor. The fort separated two distinct bodies of water, Lake Champlain and Lake George, but it also marks the boundaries of two distinct North American societies. The Francophone stream flows north, and an Anglophone one now flows south. Ticonderoga marks the point at which we find an incredible cultural shift amongst these peoples. With the Iroquois League traditionally acting as the gatekeepers, it's also triangulated in nature. New France was born out of the religious conflict, between Catholic and Protestant factions that had torn apart France at the start of the 17th century. Many of New France's early explorers were recently converted Catholics or recalcitrant Protestants. My own 12th great-grandfather was a man named Robert Boulet, and he immigrated from a war-torn southwestern Atlantic port called La Rochelle for almost a year between 1627 and 1628. A savage siege had taken place between royal Catholic forces under the command of Cardinal Richelieu against Protestant Huguenots allied to the English. The defeat of the city crushed Protestant hopes and many either converted or fled. While Protestants were overtly barred from New France, men like Samuel Champlain tended to look the other way. He hoped to populate New France with any Christian Frenchman and desired for coexistence amongst a mixed indigenous community. Champlain himself was probably born Protestant and his family converted to gain social mobility as Catholic forces slowly expanded their control over the southwestern Protestant strongholds. Champlain married well to the daughter of the French king's chief first minister. The minister's name was Nicolas Boulet, and his daughter was a young woman by the name of Helene. Aged only 12 years old in 1610, she wouldn't officially join Champlain's house until two years later. My great-grandfather, Robert, was born 20 years later to Helene's sibling. Samuel Champlain is my great-uncle through his marriage to a Boulet, a little over 30 years later, my great-grandfather would leave from La Rochelle under a marriage contract and was granted land on the island of Orléans near Quebec City. Ticonderoga is a French corruption of the Iroquois word for the meeting place of the two waters. Before the Battle of Fort Carillon or Benedict Arnold's famed intrusion, this was the site of one of the first major battles fought on North American soil. The site itself sits at the carrying place where Lake George drains out into Lake Champlain via the Les Chute River. The bluff that sat high above the place would later serve as the site for future European fortifications. The surrounding area was sacred to the Mohawk Band of Iroquois and served as a burial ground. On July 30, 1609, Champlain led a force of several hundred Huron, Algonquin, and Montagnais against 200 Mohawk on the shore beneath the bluff. Carefully disguising his arquebus soldiers behind allied native warriors, Champlain was able to flank the oncoming Mohawk assault by firing into their rear. Each arquebus fired several projectiles at once, and the disorienting new weapon quickly broke a determined Mohawk resistance. Driven headlong into the woods and pursued by Champlain, many Mohawk were taken as captives, who would be ritually tortured. Though this horrific end for many was a gruesome first introduction to European firearms, what I find interesting is the use of mobile field barricades that Champlain notes were in use by the natives. The Mohawk had constructed such a fort, but abandoned it for the field. Champlain would later attack similar forts in a successful manner by constructing elevated firing platforms that gave the attackers the correct angle of fire into the fort. Play. 
Champlain's battle against the Iroquois at this crucial geographic nodule of movement would set off almost 175 years of warfare to control the important pivot point of the continent. As French and British power grew over the preceding century, the League sought to maintain a neutral zone and freedom of movement through this choke point, but European imperial rivalries continued to outpace even the best diplomatic efforts of the Iroquois peoples. French efforts at fortifying their portion of the water route north from Ticonderoga increased in tempo by the 1730s, with the establishment of Fort St. Frederick, or the future Crown Point. Numerous invasion attempts had utilized this passage, and the French and Indian War finally brought issue of control to a head. The Battle of Lake George in 1755 saw a French invasion force barely defeated above Albany. Retreating to the carrying place between the two waters, French royal commanders knew it was critical to fortify the area against English counterattacks and to provide another forward operating base against British positions south of Lake George. The spot that French engineers began work on October 14, 1755, was a forested peninsula that ended in a rocky bare ledge. The future fort would jut out and overlook the southern portion of Lake Champlain. Here could be glimpsed the La Chute River, which connected the two lakes and the path that led down to the extreme southern limits of Lake Champlain, which stretches as far south as modern-day Whitehall, New York, like a tiny tendril. French guns could control the passage onto Lake George via the Lay Chute, or monitor any lake traffic attempting the eastern runaround via Wood Creek to the southern shores of Lake George. The landscape made it difficult to decide upon the appropriate layout for the fortifications. While the bare tip of the peninsula was flat, the land rose to a high ridge directly outside of this to the south. The site also was faced by Mount Independence across the water and Rattlesnake Mountain to the southwest. Both of these positions afforded a determined enemy suitable elevation for bombardment. Ideally, a series of fortifications would cover the entire area. The opposing elevations across the lake could have outposts and two sites would be constructed on the peninsula, the main fort on the high ridge, and a secondary position on the bluff to control the waters below. This would have required a monumental undertaking and resources that were far beyond any the French royal government could muster in North America at the time. Both finances and time dictated that only one fort at one position could be adequately constructed at the moment. The site chosen was the bare flat bluff astride the water routes below. Michael Laramie writes, On October 14, 1755, the French army of several hundred workmen swarmed over the peninsula. Everything had to be brought to the site. Tools, provisions, men and horses all had to be carried by water from Montreal. The first structures to go up were the engineering sheds within a small village that was taking shape below the fort. By November, the troops had hacked out a 15-foot wide and 5-foot deep outline of the fort from the rock and earth. Double rows of timber were placed 10 feet apart within the outline of the fort and secured to one another at intervals with dovetailed cross members. This hollow box was filled in with earth from the trench at its foundations, and by the end of the month, the walls reached seven feet, and a few crude buildings were erected as barracks. A raised redoubt was placed to cover the boat landing site at the all-important docks below the fort's emplacement. In May of 1756, the bastions of the fort were constructed and properly faced with casement to protect from cannon shot. By July, the walls were eight feet tall and had begun to be lined with stone. Two outer bastions were hacked from the rock by hand, and the entire structure received parapets and platforms by August. A hospital was added, and a proper channel mapped for boats to the future pier being constructed. A barracks or shed blockhouse was raised next to the fort in order to house more troops. A sawmill and outposts were constructed along the La Chute River as well. The very beginnings of a small village and active military post had emerged on the edge of the North American wilderness by the start of 1757. The new French post would serve as the operating base for the infamous strike south against British Fort William Henry. While a significant military victory for the French, the British would regroup in 1758 and counterattack the future Fort Ticonderoga from among the haunting ruins of the former British fortress. British commander James Abercrombie was able to muster the largest British North American army ever assembled, totaling almost 18,000 men. British reimbursement to colonial legislatures had allowed a huge increase in recruitment bounties available. 
Almost 12,000 men out of the 18,000 total were provincials from the British colonies. By early July 1758, the British had encamped among the haunting ruins of Fort William Henry at the southern end of Lake George. A gigantic artillery train containing thousands of rounds of ammunition had been stockpiled and intended to be used against every French fortification between Carillon and Montreal. 1,000 boats had been constructed to move this huge force north toward their destination of Fort Carillon, located at the carrying point between Lake Champlain and Lake George. On July 5, 1758, the large British flotilla shoved off from the ruins of Fort William Henry and assured their massive advantage in men and material would guarantee victory. The Marquis de Montcalm arrived at Fort Carillon in end of June 1758 to find an undermanned and undersupplied position. Despite his best efforts, the French had around 3,400 men ready for duty, with the reinforcements from Montreal, led by Chevalier de la Vie, being the last to arrive. Supplies were tallied, and it was determined the post had about one week's worth of food left in its stores. Fort Carillon was also incomplete and ill-situated, tactically speaking. French engineers failed to site a large hill to the west and a smaller one to the north, both of which could be ideal positions from which to bombard the defenders. Given the poorly situated fortifications, Montcalm instead opted to order his men out of the fort and onto a hill that sat astride the only access road. Montcalm's inspiration for this seemingly ad hoc and hastily formulated plan could have come from a recent nightmare. He had much to contemplate as he lay wounded under a mound of French bodies on July 19, 1747, near Assietta in northwestern Italy. As he lay in a ditch below a cleverly designed wooden palisade several thousand feet up in the Alps, he contemplated how his overwhelming force of 25,000 French could be completely crushed by a mere 7,500 strong Piedmontese force guarding the route to Turin. Asieta was a ridge that ran between two important valleys leading directly into Piedmont itself. The ridge dropped off for several thousand feet on both sides, and so the slopes were fortified using the undulating terrain. French forces attempted to gain the positions through major charges made in column form along the breastworks. Montcalm would have mentally noted the angle of fire for the defenders and the inability to bring artillery to bear on the chosen position. This combined with cleverly disguised defensive works that incorporated natural elements led to 5,000 French dead in a single afternoon. Carillon possessed a similar terrain advantage and defensive angle of fire on the ridge just south of the fort. It was here that Montcalm chose to meet Abercrombie and the British in a similar four to one disadvantage that the Piedmontese faced. Montcalm clearly had an actionable plan that he personally saw worked well against great odds, like the one he would be facing. The construction of Montcalm's defensive strategy was directly linked to his harrowing experience at Asieta and would give his outnumbered forces a fighting chance to defeat the British. Beat the on July the 6th, the British flotilla was spotted by French scouts on the northern edge of Lake George. They reported that the columns of boats stretched seven miles down the lake. The British force landed four miles southwest of French positions, with General Howe leading the first landing party of light infantry ashore. Howe had begun to make reforms with the focus on light infantry and cavalry to combat the guerrilla warfare of the French. General Howe was the brother of William and Richard, both of Revolutionary War fame. The French did not stand idle, and their scouting party engaged Howe, whose column was guided by Israel Putnam. Howe was hit and mortally wounded, but the British inflicted over 300 casualties on the fleeing French. His death would shock the British and stall their forward progress. This would provide Montcalm with the extra few days he needed to complete a series of interlocked abatis in a semicircle around the crest of the hill on the access road north of Carillon. The abatis would be set below a series of trenches, but would only delay the British. Any determined application of proper artillery fire and the French fortifications would turn from a sanctuary to a hellscape of flying splinters. Montcalm hoped the wooden spikes could delay the large British force and allow a proper defense to be set up for the St. Lawrence River Valley. Unwilling to waste any more precious manpower in pointless engagements, Montcalm recalled all pickets back to the newly constructed fortifications. British forces were free to ascend the heights around the fort, and scouts reported what they believed to be a small, unfinished breastwork occupied outside the fort on July 7th. Rumors that 3,000 French reinforcements were on their way from Montreal added urgency 
to the situation Abercrombie now faced. On July 8th, 7,000 British regulars with another 6,000 provincials in reserve were ordered forward to sweep away a meager French force supposedly hiding behind some brush and thin branches. Like Montcalm had feared, the British intended to blast the French out from behind their hastily erected barricades with artillery. They dutifully towed a series of field pieces down a small river next to the fort, but floated within range of the fort's batteries. Gunners sunk one barge and the others quickly rowed back down the river. The British infantry would have to carry the day, and Abercrombie felt he had more than enough manpower to break the French defenders. A little past midday, the general British assault began under a hot New York summer sun. The steep and undulating terrain allowed the French to shoot down at a vertical angle and still keep their heads hidden by the top of the breastwork. The defenses ended up well constructed and being hewed from whole interconnected logs. The ad hoc appearance to British scouts had been clever camouflage to hide the stoutness of the works. While the original plan was for a coordinated attack along the entire line, New York provincials on the left engaged with the French screening forces and the right wing of the British assumed a general assault was underway. Each wing now attacked piecemeal and were instantly stopped by the French wooden palisades. Loopholes manned by expert riflemen and swivel guns that provided covering crossfire blended perfectly with the terrain. When General Abercrombie reached the front, he did little to help reorganize his disjointed attacks. Amongst the bravest displays of gallantry against this murderous defense, the 42nd Scottish Highlanders known as the Black Watch managed to break through the French fortifications only to be isolated and slaughtered. When advancing, they appeared like roaring lions breaking from their chains. For their efforts, the Black Watch suffered a 65% casualty rate with almost 700 dead in an afternoon. Any coordinated infantry assault was hopelessly broken up in the tangled mass of logs, and the delay allowed the French defenders to pour continuous fire on isolated formations. A total of six charges were ordered, including the use of colonial reserves in order to force the position, but to no avail. Montcalm and the Chevalier de Levis could be seen amongst the breastworks, encouraging their men and directing reinforcements to counter each successive British assault. By 7 p.m., almost 2,500 British and 400 French were battlefield casualties. It was the deadliest day for the British Army in North America until the Battle of New Orleans in 1815. Abercrombie gave a set of confusing orders to his shocked and retreating troops. Misinterpretations turned an orderly retreat into a panicked rout as British forces fled headlong to their boats on the northern shore of Lake George. Montcalm did not realize the extent of his victory until French scouts brought word back of the British retreat several days later. The Marquis did not have anywhere near the number of troops required to follow this momentous victory up and could only hunker down for winter. Still, the French victory was impressive and quite impactful given that Louisbourg would fall that summer and throw open one gateway to Quebec. By holding on to Carillon, Montcalm had ensured another door stayed firmly shut to the British for now. To honor king and country, Montcalm had a large red cross inscribed overlooking the French breastworks outside the fort. The inscription on that red cross read, Christian behold, not all the care that Montcalm took, nor this fearsome abatis, nor our hero's feats have stunned the English here, or shattered all their hopes. Instead, the arm of God prevailed, the victor of this cross. General Amherst would seek to regain the honor lost a year before to Montcalm outside of Fort Carillon. This would be time to sink with Wolfe's attempted strike at Quebec down the St. Lawrence River. As much as Abercrombie was foolhardy, Amherst was a consummate professional. The year of 1759 would not see the repeated mistakes that had cost the British king in both blood and treasure. 11,000 men were assembled near the former site of Fort William Henry by June, and a concentrated effort to secure the supply route to Fort Edward and the Hudson was commenced. The portage road was widened considerably, and fortified posts were placed to cover the length of the route. New France was under considerable pressure, and Montcalm was manning the walls of Quebec City, so instructions were sent to the 3,500 men at Fort Carillon. They were to abandon the position after the British had landed in force, a small detachment was to cover the retreat and blow the fort up. This force would then follow the same pattern at Crown Point and retreat to the far north of Lake Champlain to make their last stand. The British flotilla left the southern end of Lake George on July 21st and were in position by the morning of July 22nd to begin their assault. Sweeping aside a small French guard at the sawmill along the Lachute River, 
British forces quickly advanced onto the peninsula and found themselves occupying the very trenches where so many of their comrades had died the year before. Since the French intended to evacuate, they didn't bother to take up a commanding position on the ridge and meet the British in the trenches as Montcalm had. Overnight, the majority of the French forces slipped away toward Fort St. Frederick, and a skeleton crew attempted to blow the structure to deny the British use. The fuse only detonated a single bastion, and the British were able to claim the fort with a majority of the structure in usable condition. The newly renamed Fort Ticonderoga would remain in British hands for 17 more years until some enterprising colonial subjects hatched a daring plan that would once again place Ticonderoga at the center of North America's historical narrative. Thanks for listening to New York, Quebec, and the water route to the center of the world. Thank you.